I would go over to Nick's place and he would put all this stuff down himself. I mean, I never did any of the recording. I just went over there and tried to patch it up because um, his idea of editing was, you know, he'd just do it once. And even if it wasn't quite right, he'd just go with it, you know. So I would listen to it. And the first listen, you'd be like, oh, this is this is kind of cool. And then you'd be like, wait, yeah, but wait a minute, what the fuck? What, what's that? Wait a minute, hang on a minute. You know, and then you'd have to go back and then you'd be like, oh, oh uh, yeah, well, this edit's fucked up. You know, you got to like, you know, so there was a lot of, I, I tried to fix it up as much as possible. That was, that was really my job going over there was to uh, try and, you know, try and make head or tail of it, you know. So uh, I, I I haven't heard any of it for, for 30 years. So I, I don't know what, it, I don't know how it ended up. I don't know what happened with it really it was really like a pre-production phase then because you're trying to you know i mean i was basically trying to understand all the bits and there was certainly there were bits that didn't fit and bit you know that would have been better in other places and and you know but at that point we uh we didn't really have good enough equipment or anything to really get in there and do like some serious stuff so it would have been much better to just kind of work out what it was and then rehearse a band and then go in and actually play the songs, you know. So and uh, I, I don't know if we ever got to vocals that much. So, you know, I don't know, probably you put the vocals on maybe after I was there. But, you know, uh, yeah, kind of, you know, it, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I, like you say, it was it was really just kind of a notebook of ideas just a notebook of uh, all his different thing. And I think he just tried kind of slung them together. And he was a great one. I know that at the time when he got that computer, he, uh, he also wanted to buy a uh, 3d max, which was called 3d studio in those days. So he was doing some 3d stuff. Cause I was doing a lot of 3d uh, uh, animation and stuff like that. And uh, he, when he started to work on 3d max, he did all those kind of, uh, you know, uh, pixel pick you know pixel pictures like uh, uh computer pictures and they were totally different from anything that i would ever do i mean it was like it was like crazy stuff he would just keep piling stuff on and doing all the wrong things and come up with something great you know you'd be like what the fuck how the fuck did you make how did you how did you make it do that and he'd be like dude i just put this and dude fucking added this and added this you know you know what nick was like i mean he just like he 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 push it. He roll the lever, but he roll it. You know, push it further than it's supposed to go. So, you know, and it was the same with his playing. I think in a lot of ways, you know, he just like fucking. You know, he just try and push it further all the time. Push it further. didn't know him before uh before we started mixing and then he would come he would come by the studio when we were mixing we mixed at one-on-one -on -one in north hollywood great big room huge room and mm -hmm. uh well, that's where we did lynch mob actually R wicked sensation in the big room but they had a mix room in the front so uh nick would pop in like early in the day because he knew that dave wouldn't be there so he'd come in early in the day and like hang out a little bit and say hi and you know so uh and i didn't really know nick very well until we got into doing rehearsals with um countdown that's really when we started to uh you know be buddies really I mean, what i was doing was uh riding a moving click so in the in the rehearsals we would tape i would tape the rehearsal and when we got a finished um arrangement uh we would have to have the band play it and i would try and get a good take, a good rehearsal take. And then I would take it home and time, uh, time out every four bars and build a, a, a tempo map of how they played it. And that would give me the information about, oh, okay, they speed up a little bit into the pre-chorus. Okay, they pull down a little bit in the chorus. So that's, you know, and they start to understand how things, what makes things, what makes the song move properly. Um, so we would, I would write, then write that into a click track that was moving. 
And then the next day I would take it into the rehearsal and I'd say, okay, I want you to try this click track and see how it feels. And then we would run that, run that click track and they would come back and go, I don't know, man, it's kind of dragging in the chorus or, you know, whatever. And so we would adjust it and go backwards and forwards like a successive approximation. So um, when, and funny, when we went in to do Countdown, the night before we finished um, all this stuff, we did all this, all this stuff and they played with these clicks and we got all the clicks just how we wanted them. And um, I went back to my apartment and the next day we were going into um, uh, pa- uh, what, uh, wherever it was, uh, the Enterprise. And uh, my truck got broken into and they stole all my equipment. So I, hadn't, I, I didn't have any of those <laughs> click tracks when we walked into the studio. So I had to walk in and go, oh, guys, bad news. Uh, no click tracks and they're all like oh fuck so I said but you know what they've been rehearsing with them for so long that they almost didn't need them so we made so I made simulations of them really quick for each song and uh, that worked fine because they actually already knew where they were supposed to go and Nick was very good like that so he really didn't uh, uh, you know he really didn't stray and one of the things we do is and you can hear it on the euthanasia thing is we give them an upbeat click track. It's not very many downbeats because when the, when the drummer's hitting the downbeat, he can't hear the click. So what you want, so what he tends to do is slow down so he can hear the, oh, there's the click. And then he'll speed up and they go, oh, wait a minute, there's the click. And, 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 tend, to, and tend to weave either side. So by this point, I was when I was working with any band, I, I would make a moving click, which was syncopated in the headphones so that they can always hear it and they don't have to try and hunt for the downbeat. They would, they would be just in the groove of it. So that's what we used for that. That was one of the, maybe the second or third time I started using that kind of technique. And the other technique we used in the studio with Nick was I had him play all the way through with no fills. He didn't do the fills at the same time. And then we would go back and figure out where the fills went and we would window punch the whole kit in because we were working on a Sony 24 track digital. So it went in to the millisecond instead of going, you know, you couldn't really do that with analog, but with digital, you could do it. So then we go back and do each put punch in each fill uh, and th- throughout the song, maybe it'd be six, eight fills, 10 fills. We'd go through and work on each fill, which fitted with the music and was the right fill. So he was then able to just work, you know, then we go in like the downbeat before the fill or kick drum or two before the fill or the snare before the fill, whichever it was. And he, he'd be able to play up to it and he'd just be able to whip these fills and really concentrate on just the fill. So we'd be able to get really good drum tracks. And actually in, in a lot of cases, he, he knew what fill, fills, you know, we'd, in rehearsal, we'd worked on a lot of the fills as well. So everything was really pretty well rehearsed, you know. And he did very well. And uh, he hits very hard. And he's very consistent. And uh, he, he looks a lot wilder than that, but he's pretty accurate, you know. Uh, the studio didn't stay in Phoenix. Uh, we took it all down and put it into two semis and moved it back to uh, Burbank. And I rebuilt it in Burbank, for, and it was there for about three years. That's a whole story about euthanasia. It wasn't what he wanted, so he didn't really like the record that much. And uh, I think that uh, he wanted to move on, you know, if people want to move on. He didn't want to work with me anymore, I guess, and he wanted to move on. And he, I think Dave thinks that he could do everything after watching somebody. He can just do everything. He wants to be in control all the time. So, you know, that's a natural thing for him. So, you know, to, to sort of move on and say, well, you know, I'm going to do it now. Because there's some things about that that, you know, some things about euthanasia that Max did that I don't like. So I'm not going to let that happen anymore. I'm going to do it myself, you know. I assume that is what... And, and, and I know that he uh, he uh, messed around with that record quite a lot afterwards. He sped up some tracks and he remixed it and he did all kinds of crazy things. So, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, he, Dave, Dave's like that. He's a, he's an independent guy, you know, and uh, he, he just, he wants to be in control. So I, I, I assume that that's why, I, as to why he'd moved to Nashville, I have no idea. But 
but in in those days, a lot of people were moving to Nashville uh, because it was all uh, there was a lot of grunge out at the time. So everything was kind of doing this as far as rock music and you know metal stuff, any kind of metal and stuff like that was just basically uh, you know starting to disappear. And everybody was looking at each other, going, and, and you know, oh, we're we're a bit fucked here, and. Um, that was hitting about halfway through euthanasia. So, you know, uh, there, there were some adjustments made in there to try and compensate for that, you know, either by Dave or by myself. But, uh, you know, it was a very difficult time for, for that kind of band, for Metallica, for Megadeth, for, you know, I mean, Metallica were doing right because they came out with, you know, they, they were a little more poppy, so they had a little more, you know, but the but the more metal bands were having a really bad time. So uh, and, and and of course at the same time, uh, everything was coming out it was Napster and all you know and, and everything was going online and the streaming was starting to happen and you know people people were buying files instead of buying physical objects. So of course the artist wasn't getting any of that. So you know that that's when the whole decline of the music industry was starting to happen. And so uh, a lot of people changed just basically changed jobs or changed locations. Like a lot of people went to Nashville. I know like Michael Wagner went down there and, you know, a lot of people went, went down there. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy that went down there and worked with Shania, uh, Matt Lang. Yeah. He moved to Nashville, you know, and, you know, it's like a lot of people were saying to me, Oh dude, you gotta, be, you gotta do country. And I'm like, you've over my fucking dead body. But I can't, there's something I, I there's something I just can't cope with opera and country music. I actually rather listen to opera, but even that is a bit of a stretch. But country music, I just I, it's it's beyond me. I can't listen to it. So I said I'm not fucking moving to Nashville and doing country music, even though country music at that point was actually sounding pretty much like you know fucking rock music, you know, except that they were guys were yodeling a bit, you know, and not getting high enough. But you know. You know, I mean, high enough as far as pitch, anyway. But anyway, I digress. So that's really what happened. I mean, uh, the whole plan was to take that whole uh, studio and move it back to Los Angeles anyway. So we we built it with double-headed nails so that we could pull it all apart. So, you know, that was the whole, that was the whole story with that. That all worked fine. As I said, we rebuilt it in um, Burbank. Uh, and it was there for about three and a half years. And then the bottom really dropped out of the music business and it became impossible to just keep it running. It was subject. You couldn't pay the rent. You know, I couldn't pay the rent and afford to pay the AC. And of course, in the studio, you've got to have the AC on all the time. So, you know, it became impossible. So eventually I had to close that down, you know. Dave at that time thought he knew he, he knew what it was. And Dave actually came to me before euthanasia and said, I want you to teach me everything you know. And I said, well, I said, I ain't going to do it. But I said, you, you just keep an eye out. You know, you just have to watch and listen. You know, I said, I, I, I have no idea how to teach you everything I know because I don't know what I know. You know, that it just is what it is. So I said, you know, you have to watch and you have to learn. <laughs> what, what can I tell you? I said, you know, I know what I know because of 25 years before this, I've been in the business. But, you know, you know, learn, learn it all in like eight weeks if you can, you know, <laughs> so, you know, whatever. So I think that Dave thought, okay, um, I done, you know, these f a few records with this guy. Now I know everything he knows. Now I'm going to go and do it myself and I don't have to pay him, you know, don't have to pay a producer and blah, blah, blah. And of course everything else changed at that time too, you know, um, uh, the whole music situation changed. It went into grunge, you know, and basically Megadeth sort of basically disappeared because I couldn't get arrested at that point. It just weren't, you know, it was from, you know, super high up in, uh, in 94, whatever it was. And then super, super dived down by 98, you know, so that's, that's just the way the world works, you know, but I, I, I don't know that that's happened to me many times. Uh, you make a great record with the band, and then they go to somewhere, they go somewhere. It's like it happened with Lynch Mob. You know, we made a Wicked Sensation. And uh, I mean, I couldn't have made a better record at the time. And I don't, I don't think George or, or Mick or, or Anthony or anybody 
you know, would have could have made a better record. And they, uh, George didn't really talk to me after it. You know, he went and then he went and you know got got rid of Oni and got uh, what's her name Mason in. You know, it was a great singer. I mean, actually, it was a good record. I think they, I don't know who did the next one. Was it Neverson did the next one? I don't know, but but he never called me back. So that that happens quite a lot. It happened with the uh, Dangerous Toys too. You know, made the first Dangerous Toys record, eighty three or eighty five. I forget when it was, but that was huge on MTV when MTV was there. But then. You know, next record they uh, they sent me the demos. I said these these most of these songs aren't any good. You got to do some more writing. And they never called me back. They got pissed off, and they had Roy Thomas Baker make the record, and it was the hor most horrible record ever. But uh, whatever. This is this comes under the heading of what you have to do as a producer, and and what you the first thing you got to do if you ever want to be produced properly is you have to tell the truth, and you have to have an opinion, and you got to stick to it. And so. Uh, got a cassette from Dave for Countdown and uh, there wasn't a lot of vocals on there was a little bit of vocals but it was mostly all riffs and everything like that and I didn't know really what to do with it and uh, I listened to it for a day and I thought fuck it's a, I don't really know what to do with this and then and then I thought to myself well you know what I, I'm just going to keep listening you know because eventually and this is this is a technique I think it, it's kind of comes from Sherlock Holmes thing where he says, you know, when I've eliminated everything that cannot be, then whatever is left has to be what it is. So, uh, and I noticed this about Mutt Lang. I've been noticing this for years about Mutt Lang. It's like, you can't find anything wrong with it. you got to listen like a hundred times. And then I realized, you know, Mutt Lang listened to Pyromania fucking a thousand times. And then finally he goes, oh, you know what? That bit's not right. So he fixes it. And then he listens to it another four, 300 times. Then he goes, wait a minute. That bit could be better right there. Then he fixes it. And so, you know, it's a period, obviously it's a successive, a successive approximation and diminishing returns. So you, 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 if you don't know what to do with something, this is the general rule now. This is the rule for the production book. If you don't know what to do, you haven't listened to it long enough. You've got to listen to it more. If you listen to it more, eventually it will come right back at you and go, oh, yeah, that bit's kind of fucked. Let's get rid of that bit. So that's, that's, that's what I did with, with Dave's cassette. I get to the third day, I, I put it on again, and then all of a sudden I go, oh, yeah, that bit's fucking too long. We should cut that in half. So and then I go, oh. So I got the book out, started you know, writing down with the old pencil. And writing stuff down and and went through all the songs and i started to know what to do with them so you know it's, okay this is really cool but this is in the wrong place the way this is set up it's all you know let's let's do this let's change this arrangement all this kind of stuff so i wrote about i suppose five pages of uh, notes and um i sent them over to dave and uh, i didn't hear anything for like a few days he doesn't fucking want to know, you know, he's going to call me up and rip me a new asshole, you know? So, uh, finally, uh, I'm upstairs working in my little studio and he, uh, my wife at the time called me, uh, called me and said, Oh, Dave Mustaine's on the phone. So I go, um, Dave, how are you doing? He goes, ah, oh, Max. He goes, uh, yeah, I, I, I got all your notes just like that. And then he, and then he doesn't say anything. So it's this big, long, pregnant pause from, for a long time, maybe 10, 15 seconds. And I didn't say anything because, <laughs> because nothing is a brilliant thing to say and often the right thing to do. But anyway, finally, he goes, I agree with about 98% of them. So I was like, oh, thank fuck for that. So. That was really what he said, let's, you know, so let's do it. I said, okay, great. So but that's really how we started, how, how I actually got into producing that record, you know. And then uh, we did a lot of pre-production, of course. And, uh, but they, actually David rehearsed the band uh, and done all the changes. And then he didn't call me to come down to, uh, might be mates, right? I don't, anyway, um, I think that Rod Stewart was down in one sound stage, and we were in one, and you know, there was all kinds of groovy people around. But anyway, um, 
he didn't call me till they got it all done. And I went down there and I took a computer down there and, uh, and uh, you know, a, a drum machine and a few cables and stuff like that so that we could work out the clicks and get all the tempos and set all that stuff. And by the time I got there, I, I, there was very little arrangement that we had to do. So really I was looking then now at performance. So the songs are arranged. They're, you know, they're the right arrangements. They're, they're the right parts. Now we're looking at performance. So, you know, at that point, it was just kind of, and the, the, the one thing that you want to do before you get in the studio is make sure you know what the tempos are so that, you know, you don't end up with a take that you do in the morning, which is nice and fast. And then you, you listen to it at night and go, oh, fuck, it's too fast. You know, I mean, it, it's a very important thing because if you don't get that right, you, you're fucked. So anyway, you know, so we worked on that mainly. And then, um, as I say, we took all, you know, we, I rehearsed them greatly with the moving click uh, and to make sure that we could get a repeatable result and a uh, very good technique for guaranteeing at least one part of the performance. And uh, it also gives the, the band members, especially the drummer, in this case, Nick, it also gives them a, a, a lot of uh, 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 peace of mind. Uh, they, get, they get a lot of confidence because they know they know what's going on. They know it. They know that it's working. They know this. They can get in the groove. They know it's going to feel good. So that they're, they're already kind of halfway there. So that makes it much easier to get a take. So then, and as you know, in the studio, there's it, a lot of messing around. There's a lot of drum tuning. There's a lot of you know, getting stuff ready. You know, getting stuff ready. Getting so when it when it gets up to the, when it gets up to actually doing a take, then there's a really heightened atmosphere in the room usually. And it's a very electric atmosphere and you want to be able to just like go, right, there it comes, man. Bang. And you hit the, you hit the click and they just start ripping into it. And, 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 and you can get the take right there. You can get the take in the first or second take. It was always ready to go. And so, uh, but of course, you know, uh, with these records, you're going to do the drums first. And then after that is really it doesn't have anything to do. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure on the drummers, Nick, you know, but uh, he had no problem with it. He works, he, he works very hard. He worked very hard in rehearsals. He always worked very hard, you know, and he's a hard hitter and he is just smashing the crap out of them. He wouldn't go using up his energy before the, before any of the sessions or anything like that. He'd always, uh, you know, um, He'd always like stay cool, stay mellow, so that you'd have plenty of energy to play the drums. Uh, that's the first time that we used uh, the Sony 24 track digital. That's the first digital album that we, we did with Megadeth. And, uh, uh, so, and that's an amazing machine. It sounds amazing. And uh, uh, it, 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 it's, very, uh, it's very easy to... Uh, patch stuff up, you can do window punches on it, punch stuff in, punch stuff out, in totally invisible, totally repeatable. You can run that 10 times and fix something. So it's a really, uh, it's, a, it's a really conducive environment to, uh, to getting on with what, you know, especially if you know exactly what you gotta do. And uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it went, it went really smoothly. Yeah, and we had plenty of time in there uh, and uh, we had plenty of time and everybody was pretty pretty good. Uh, Dave wasn't sitting around while Marty was doing his solos. You know, he Marty would come in, and it would just be Marty and myself. And we put a notice on the door and uh, just say, "Okay, no visitors. You know, keep out." And we would just go through the solos and get them. You know, get them like perfect. And of course, Marty's a lovely player, so you know that's always a pleasure to do. And uh, and uh, with Dave. Um, uh, when it comes down to the vocals, um, he he knows what he wants pretty much, but he's very he is very uh, he's very accessible as far as uh, su suggestions. Um, so uh, he he's actually pretty easy to work with with as far as vocals. There's one thing that he he does, uh, or he, he in those cases he did uh, uh, let me really kind of call the shots on them and say, okay, that's good day. All right, now, you know, let's get a better one of that or whatever, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah it, was, it wasn't a bad record to make. It wasn't, uh, it, it was pretty easy and we kept good time. Uh, we went in at 10 in the morning. Uh, we'd leave about, uh, 
Uh, well, they, they, most of the guys would be gone by about 10 at night, but I'd probably be there till about midnight. Um, and then I'd probably go over to residuals for a nightcap over in uh, Studio City. But uh, yeah, it was uh, really uh, pretty effortless, really. I mean, and, and super enjoyable, of course, you know, uh, to be working with all these great guys. So, you know, we, we had a great time. It was really, really a lot of fun. I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, I guess, a sort of once or twice in a lifetime, or three times in a lifetime kind of, you know, deal. But, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of things with bands, that, with politics and, you know, and, and likes and dislikes. And, you know, uh, Dave was in and out of rehab and uh, to go to go to euthanasia when we first went to for rehearsals, I had to go and pick Dave up at the rehab place. You know, it's like, you know, so there, there's a lot of factors in there. And, and uh, you know, sometimes the music steps back against, you know, all the other sort of political stuff. So, you know, and uh, you're not to bad mouth anybody. I think everybody tried to do everything. Everybody was trying to be helpful. And, and uh, you know, but, uh, you know, as you see in this last book of Dave's, you know, uh, he, he has a, he has, he always has to have the last word. And it, sometimes it's not always a nice word. So, you know, uh, people have a limited lifespan with Dave, it seems. And, and he has a limited lifetime with them. And, and he gets to the point where, you know, he, I, I don't know whether he gets bored or, you know, but he, he gets bored with everybody. He's a bit like Sharon Osborne, you know, everybody gets fired eventually, you know? So, you know, but that's true of almost every band that's ever existed. So, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, that was a great band. Actually, the whole band was just a really good band. Marty and Dave and, and, and David Addison and, and Nick, just a fucking great band. I mean, they were just, a, when they started playing, it was just like, it would just give you goosebumps, you know, and every, even if they were just jamming around or just, and of course the first uh, 10 days, you know, it's all, it's all about Nick really, you know, he's the guy on the spot and he has to do the stuff. And uh, he, he, I never had any problem. Guy was always great. And especially on the uh, euthanasia, where we basically took the whole, uh, we took the whole take, and we we kept you know as much as possible of every take. So there wasn't any real punches on euthanasia. Um, you know, he, he we'd spend about four weeks rehearsing, so he knew all the fills. He knew everything. Everybody knew everything. So then we went when we went in the studio, they were able to play this stuff like, you know, like no problem. Euthanasia is a different record. Uh, There's a little more uncertainty in euthanasia because everybody was a bit unnerved by uh, the the whole grunge thing. And, uh, you know, realizing that, you know, from going, I mean, Countdown came in at number two. The only reason it came in at number two on the album charts was because Michael Jackson released Thriller, I think, at the same time, and that was number one. So, you know, to go from that kind of height to go into like, oh, shit, nobody even likes this kind of stuff anymore, you know, uh, and you couldn't get on KNAC or, uh, you know, any of the LA stations, which was really what everybody wanted to, you know, do, as you know, you know. Um, uh, so. Uh, there was some uncertainty there, um, but I, I don't think really it was down too much to Dave. I picked him up out of uh, rehab and we uh, went and did, uh, and then we went and started rehearsals and he was actually pretty good in rehearsals. Um, there was no, he didn't fall back on anything. Uh, so, uh, and he was pretty conducive. So, you know, uh, I, I don't think it got, so uh, I don't think that, his state was particularly rocky. Maybe a little towards the end of euthanasia, he started to get a little more unstable. Um, maybe because uh, we were able to go out and have a drink and after the, after the session and, and go and have something to eat. And we, I would, you know, and by this time, Nick and I were good friends. So, um, you know, we would probably go up to uh, Scottsdale and, and go to a sushi place or something. And there'd be a few, you know, half of the, crew would be there or Mick Zane would be there or whoever. And, uh, you know, maybe Dave, probably not Dave Ellison, but maybe Marty. So I think, you know, 
um, Dave gets a little jealous, you know, but but it's a rock and a hard place because he couldn't be anywhere where there was anybody drinking. He didn't wouldn't put himself in that position, I guess. And you know that that's a pretty tough position to be in. So I got every sympathy for him. So you know, um, you know, I understood it. But there again, I understand. I understand how he gets a bit pissed off where everybody's going out and having a good time, and he's just you know he has to go home. <laughs> you know or he has to go out for a meal but with pam but but not drink any wine or you know so i mean a very difficult situation so i think that he that was very frustrating for dave you know towards the end of that record you know um and you know the whole the whole atmosphere the whole atmosphere of the music business was changing very rapidly and uh the internet was just coming out they had a website they were one of the first bands to have a website out there and they did a live thing from the website and all this so it was all a, it was all a bit. Uh, it's a bit hard to be oriented. It's a bit disorienting, I think, for everybody. So you know, uh, everybody was kind of well, uh, you know, is this right? Are we doing the right thing here, or, or are we doing the wrong thing? You know, and of course, it, it's all it's all twenty twenty hindsight. Of course, Dave thinks that we did the wrong thing, but of course, it, you know, everybody really liked the record, so. You, I, I don't know, you know, what can you do? You know, the record actually sold about the same as uh, Countdown. But, you know, so, you know, I know a lot of people that like that better than Countdown, but I know a lot of people that say Euthanasia sucks and, and Countdown's a lot better. And I know that Trent Reznor says Countdown sucks. And so fuck him. <laughs> oh, we could put that in a different video. Sorry. <laughs> he came out one time, he comes out with this bottle of wine and it had no label on it. So he goes, here, dude, check this out. And I looked at I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, I said, there's no label on it. He goes, yeah, I made it. Check it out. So I go, you made it? He goes, yeah. I said, he said, I, I made it. Check it. Have a glass. Have a glass. So I poured it out. I had a glass and it was fantastic wine. I'm like, Nick, this is amazing wine. And he goes, yeah, that's right. Of course, he, all he'd done is put it, he got a really good bottle of wine and he put it in the sink and peeled the label off. So there was no label on it, but it was actually like about a forty dollar bottle of wine. But you know, he was always doing stuff like that. You know, so it was a funny guy. You know, mate used to make me laugh. And of course, he was always doing stuff about UFOs, which you know, Gumby will tell you about the UFO. We did some UFO work with uh, with Gumby before, right? Gumby on that above and beyond. It might have been a bit faster on the demo. I we'll probably steadied it out to 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 get the tempo a little more uh, radio friendly for that type of song. And but the lyrics were really good already. He, he does have some, you know, really great ideas for lyrics. So I had no problem with really with the lyrics. Um, probably all we did was just shorten it down to get to uh, you know to a, to a reasonable length. Because uh, the Dave's penchant for at that at that time was to do these very extended uh, se segue sequences, and everything would be like thirty-two bars instead of sixteen bars, or you know. So probably we just trimmed it down like that. Um, might have might have been my idea for the half time towards the back end, going into half time. You know, uh, that's a standard trick. Um, you know. I don't really take any credit for that because probably everybody would try that. <laughs> like you say, yeah, it's extremely digestible. Yeah. So, you know, it was, uh, yeah. And uh, it won the Doris Day Award, I think, that album. Yeah, the Doris Day Award for Endangered Animals. We we won the award for that. So we, all got, we didn't get to meet Doris, but we did. We got a plaque. From the notes that I made in my upstairs little studio at the time, but to the to when we went into the studio, uh, I didn't change much after that. Dave took all those notes and basically chopped everything down. And, 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 and when we were in the, and he into the studio with the band and figured it, you know, play, play, played it all with the band and rehearsed them. And then I went in and, uh, and we might've made a few minor changes, but really not that much. You know, uh, it turned out that we were right, pretty much right about everything, or I was right about the changes that I made or whatever. So um, it's a good track. It's a kind of a timeless track. It's a bit like Crazy Train or, or I Don't Know, or, you know, one of these, you know, 
So uh, I, I think it was good that Dave, um, that Dave would, was accessible to going that far towards the middle, if you know what I mean. You know, that I, and, and I sort of, I sort of said to him, you know, look, let's, you know, avoid the obvious, but don't always avoid the obvious, you know. So it's one of those where you go, look, this is kind of a hit. So, you know, da, na, 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 you know, it's just got that whole lilting thing with the dan, 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 you know, it, it's, it, it's really a very cliche song, but, but, but uh, it was well executed. His, his, uh, he, his, his nastiness over the top is just kind of puts the right amount of flavor to it, you know? So, uh, and uh, of course, Marty's solo is, uh, you know, lovely and, that's the great thing about Māori, by the way, is his, his uh, pacing and his, his tonality is so nice. You know, he's kind of like an Uli Roth or, a, you know, a, or a, a Pink Floyd kind of guitar, guitar player to me. But he plays very fast now, but, you know, he's very lyrical and he's got a really nice tone. So that he's very, you know, to me, he's a really creamy player. So it was a real, um, uh, it was a real joy to work with Marty. And actually... Uh, <laughs> a funny story where Marty was in there and Dave, David Ellison was at, we, we were in the studio messing around with Marty and doing some stuff and I, I, I said to Marty I said you know Marty you should really do most of the solos uh, you know because you know it sounds so good you know and, and uh, unbeknownst to me Dave was actually just had just walked in so he walked in right on that uh, comment and I sort of looked around at Dave and Fortunately, I didn't get embarrassed. I just sort of looked at Dave and raised my eyes, eyebrows and he went, yeah, I agree. You know, and I, I thought, I was like, holy shit, I got away with it, you know. But the, like, I, like I was saying at the beginning of this, when we were talking, the whole thing about producing is telling the truth. And, you know, you, you, don't, you don't hire a producer to bullshit you and be a yes man because there's no point. You're going to do that for yourself. What you got, you hire the producer to say, you know what, that bit sucks, man. Let's take it out. You know, that's what you hire the guy for. You have to tell the truth. And if you do tell the truth, you get a good result. Because, you you know, and, and if you don't tell the truth, then, then you shouldn't even be in there. You know, you, you know, you know what I mean? that's, that's the whole point. That's the other producers. That's the two, the two things in the producer's handbook so far. I actually didn't go to any of Megadeth's shows. <laughs> the Ritz. And, and that was a kind of a, I hadn't been there since the Aussie album that we did in the Ritz for uh, Speak of the Devil. So that was the first time I'd ever been back there. So I thought it was pretty cool. I knew the hall though, so it was kind of cool. I never really went to see them live, but I've seen, them, I've seen a lot of footage, you know. And, uh, you know, I, hey, I've seen them up close. I know how good they are, you know, so. I think he did have a lot of good ideas. I couldn't say, um, I wasn't there on the in, in the original rehearsals for countdown at least so um i don't know how much of those i, I don't know where all those ideas came from i don't, I don't know who, where they originated but um uh, certainly with uh, euthanasia he had a lot of ideas and uh, he had you know everybody had their input on euthanasia pretty much you know and i know that dave says in his book that Oh, because they were, I should give credit to the guy on the TV because he was in the room, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, but um, I, I think it does make a difference, you know. And I think, uh, you know, if you're going to do that, if you're going to go into the writing process, to be fair, you've got to, like, give everybody a piece, you know. Maybe not even, or, you know, maybe not a quarter or a fifth or whatever it is. But you've got to give everybody a piece because you're bouncing stuff off them. You know, and you're basically, you're using them to produce a better song. So, you know, in, in that sense, it's a lot fairer, you know, if you're going to be in there, you know, or, and it's, it wasn't like Dave went in there and said, okay, this is how it goes. He would just go and start playing something. And then maybe Nick would like, he would play something a little slower and Dave would slow down and then they would get, into, you know, so it would be a, it would be a symbiosis or a multibiosis uh, affair you know and, and this is what music is, is about and it's how things good things happen is because there's a two-way conversation between you know the musicians a three-way four-way conversation so you know that's that uh, that's actually a very valuable uh, 
production tool and it's a very valuable uh, writing tool because you can immediately uh, uh, storyboard the, the song you can you can make these changes on the fly you can you know you can you can do everything to it you've got this very malleable thing you're sitting in if you're sitting at home with a you know fucking drum machine you know this, this is not this is not the same so you know you really you really get into high gear if you're in there with a bunch of good playing guys who are, who have good taste and are good musicians you know it really puts you into a whole different mode and and to not use that or to deny that that's happening uh, to me is wrong, it, you know, because it, it, it's a, it's a, now you're in a melting pot. So, you know, if you if, if you don't want to give people a piece of the song, then don't go into the rehearsals and change it with them. Because as, as soon as you start doing that, you're really relying on them to, to help you write the song. And, uh, you know, otherwise you're kind of ripping people off. <laughs> You're going, oh, look, help me with this part. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll keep that. Thanks. Okay, see ya. I mean, it's like you can't really do that. You, you know, this, you know. Anyway, so um, I, I think euthanasia was a lot like that, and uh, and I want to talk about the politics that happened afterwards. And I know that Nick called me many times and uh, was was very uh, was not happy with the the way he was treated after that. And I actually did talk to Dave uh, in uh, 2014 when they were trying to do this reunion and he actually, he did ask me to do it and um, I didn't quote him a price or anything. Uh, you know, um, he even put it in, on, in, in a few of the magazines and a few online. Oh, I'm hoping that Max can come in as well. So we're trying to do this whole thing. So it was a big deal. But then basically uh, it, it was all Dave's baby and he didn't want to, you know, share anything. And uh, of course, uh, there's, there's always two sides to every story, but I know that Nick was very unhappy with the way he was treated, and I thought he got treated pretty unfairly there. It seems like, as as, as far as what his story was, so you know, and and it just seemed like that was just another one of these things where Dave just wanted to put three guys, you know, to play all the stuff and make the money, and then he could get rid of the three guys later on, and you know, just move on and. You know what Nick was like. I mean, he just like he 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 pushed it. He rolled the lever, but he rolled it. You know, push it further than it's supposed to go. So, you know, and it was the same with his playing. I think in a lot of ways, you know, he just like fucking, you know, he just try and push it further all the time. Push it further. <laughs> Dave's the sort of guy you really can't do that to, you know, because he's just going to try and he's just going to get come back at you even more, you know, because he's always he always wants to win. So, you know, he's never going to leave you with the last word or, you know, anything like that. It is what it is. There isn't anybody on the planet that dislikes Nick, except maybe Dave Mustaine. <laughs> but he's the only guy in the world. But everybody else loves Nick because he's he's such a great character and such a likable guy, and he was really kind, and he was courteous, and he was good to the fans, and he would talk with anybody. And I'm not going to go into you know slagging off Dave because he doesn't need any help with that. He, Dave is who he is, and he doesn't need me to, to pass any comment on him. Um, and he's never said anything bad about me. So, that I'm, you know, I, I, I try not to <laughs> get, I try not to get into any kind of shouting matches, you know. His legacy is really, I think, all the fans and, and those albums. I mean, that's, that's, you know, he really was out on the forefront and uh, they did a lot of touring on that for those three records. And uh, he, he did a lot of big, they did a lot of Rock in Rio and all these European tours and, you know, they did a lot of work and the fans, I think, never forgot that. They never forgot that band because like, like I tell you, it was a big, not very often that you see a really good band. To me, I, I, that's his legacy, I guess, you know, that's what everybody else would say. It was a real gem. It was like Lemmy, you know, Lemmy was the same. Lemmy was always like that. No, no airs, no graces, you know, he'd like take, he'd like take, you know, he'd do these little practical jokes on you, Nick, but, you know, 
at the same time, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't embarrass you and he wouldn't, you know, he, he'd been, he'd always like, oh, no, come on, man, you know. It was a really nice, really, really nice guy. It was a 